So, hello again. In my tradition, we begin by saying, Dear Thai, Dear Sangha. Thai is the Vietnamese word for teacher, and so um, for us, it's connecting to the presence of Thich Nhat Hanh, our teacher in us, but it's also pointing back to all the generations of teacher to student, spiritual friend to spiritual friend, who've passed down teachings from the time of the Buddha up until this very time, and by the very act of engaging in the practice of Dharma, we're taking part in this transmission. So when I say, dear Thai, dear Sangha, it's really a, a deep statement of honoring the lineages that, um, the many lineages, all the way back to the Buddha's time. And I also know that we're all here carrying probably many lineages and spiritual traditions, so I welcome all the teachers that you carry, all the traditions that you carry, um, they're all welcome here. We'll be talking from the Buddhist tradition, but no one needs to be Buddhist tonight. Um, please make any translations in your head that you need to make for things to make sense. And hold whatever resonates, and you're welcome to let go of the rest. Um, I thought I would offer some reflections tonight on generosity and ethics or morality. Um, there are many ways that the Buddha's teachings have been summarized or characterized, even in the Buddha's times. Sometimes he would say the essence of the Dharma. Is anyone unfamiliar with the word Dharma? Okay, we're good there. Um, sometimes he would say the essence of the Dharma is like two wings of a bird. There's the wing of compassion and the wing of wisdom. And they both need to work together to fly and to get, because with just one wing you just go around in circles. Um, other times, uh, the Buddha simply said, I only teach understanding suffering and the end of suffering. That's it. Um, and other times, he said, the essence of my teaching is generosity, morality, and cultivation of the mind. And um, for those of us who are uh, often learning the Buddhist tradition, Dharma teachings in the West, outside of Asia, outside of a traditional um, Buddhist culture, we often jump right into the mind cultivation. People get pretty excited by either the health benefits that they've heard of from the stress reduction kind of practices of mindfulness, or they've heard stories of great masters and these blissful states, and we, we just want to jump in there. And we skip the teachings on generosity and morality, or maybe we get to them after many years of sitting meditation practice. So some people do meet them right off the bat, but I find it's, um, they're beautiful teachings, and they really, they so easily get um, relegated to a sense of preliminaries. Oh, that's just the basics, but you drop those once you get to the real practice of sitting meditation, right? No. <laughs> um, so that's the spirit that I want to share a little bit about the traditional teachings of generosity and ethics. Um, the Buddha had wonderful things to say about generosity. Um, and specifically, if you ever had new students, he would give them teachings about generosity. For many reasons. Um, one doesn't need to be a lifelong dedicated meditator to get something out of a teaching on generosity. Um, and it's an inclination that all of our hearts can experience pretty naturally. Um, and yet there's so much to be learned. Um, from taking on an intentional cultivation of generosity. Um, there's a beautiful quote that basically says, uh, from the Buddha, if beings knew the goodness that arises from acts of generosity, they wouldn't even throw out the washings of their bowl without offering it to someone or something. There's so much goodness that can come um, from even the smallest act of generosity. Um, and yet it can feel kind of touchy <laughs> to share teachings on generosity because some of us might have heard teachings on generosity that were used um, 
perhaps unskillfully in ways to try and shame people who weren't acting in a certain way or, or we've known people who perhaps make a big show about making donations or helping people but it kind of seems to feed their ego <laughs> and it just doesn't feel good, right? Um, so the Buddha really beautifully laid out three types of generosity. Um, the first was off, can be translated as miserly or beggarly giving, which is when there's something you don't really want, you're going to get rid of it anyways, or you don't really care about it, and you offer it. And it doesn't cost you anything, you didn't even really care about it. And it's easy to look down on that kind of giving. And yet, I so appreciate that the Buddha said, even that kind of giving has some reward because you need to start with the basics, start with the, the easiest, the, the simplest form before you're going to grow your heart wide enough to come into a, a more, um, a, a broader kind of generosity. And I know I've looked down on myself sometimes and it's easy to look down on others. Um, but that reminder of the Buddha of like any act of generosity has worth, even if it's, even if it's miserly. <laughs> Um, because it can, it can lay the foundation for greater acts of generosity. Then there's friendly giving, where there's, you have something, um, food, a piece, some clothing that, that you enjoy, and you want someone that you care about to also enjoy it. So you invite someone out to dinner and you pay for both, both of you, or um, you offer something that you really enjoy but you have a bounty of. And so there's a greater sense of connectivity, um, and there is a there's a little bit of a tug, you know, um, but it's still it's, it's a fairly easeful kind of giving, and the Buddha praised that as friendly giving, saying that this is a wonderful thing to do, um, and then he he stated what's called royal or kingly giving because kings would be the royals at that time, <laughs> um, and he said that's when you take something that's really precious. And it's usually talking about material goods, but I'll elaborate on that. Um, you take something that's really precious to you, and rather than enjoying it yourself, you give it away. Um, and the beauty in that is when it's done with a heart of freedom, it's not done out of obligation, it's not done out of duty, it's not done for show, but, but it's possible to develop a heart that becomes so free and so connected that whether I enjoy this sweater or you enjoy this sweater, it's being enjoyed and it's wonderful. And the sense of separation has really disappeared. And when the heart is that free, um, there's a lot of other freedom that also arises <laughs> in the, the mind stream. You know, we've, we've let go of greed, we've let go of aversion, we've let go of delusion. It's, it's really remarkable and yet, I know when I started learning about generosity, um, I wanted myself to be in the kingly giving state and I didn't experience it very much and then I berated myself. <laughs> um, so I come back time and time again of, it doesn't matter what kind of generosity I'm practicing, if it's being cultivated, it can always lead a little further into connection into, we'd say, non-self or not a sen lessening the sense of separate self, letting go of a sense of greed and, and um, scarcity that leaves us pulling and tight. And it's very reasonable almost to have a sense of scarcity because <laughs> we live in a capitalist society and we've been brainwashed to think that there's not enough to go around. Advertising campaigns are built upon getting us to want more and to try to hoard more. We have been thoroughly manipulated into believing in a scarcity mentality um, for most of us, for most of our lives. Um, so if it doesn't come naturally, it's fine. It's not, a, it's not a criticism. The Buddha's invitation is to look and say, can you remember a time when there was a natural outpouring of giving from your heart? Can you think of a time where that just spontaneously happened? And how did you feel when that happened? Like, did it feel good? <laughs> was there some freedom there? It's not, a, it's not a moral obligation from the outside 
to get to a theoretical reward in a distant future. It's an invitation to tune in and see, how does it feel when you do this? Does it brighten the mind? Does it open connectivity? Does it diminish isolation and stress and fear and anger? Well, if, if it's doing that to your mind, why wouldn't you want to do more? <laughs> that's, that's the intention and the invitation behind the teachings of really all the Buddhist teachings. Um, but especially with generosity, if there's a feeling of a pinch of discomfort maybe from other types of generosity that maybe we were forced into or guilted into in the past, um, just know that that's the, this is the intention of the gift of letting ourselves <laughs> open and free our heart, mind, streams. Mm. And a lot of the traditional teachings will speak specifically of the relationship between lay and monastic communities where um, food, medicine, shelter, and clothing was given from the lay community and the Dharma teachings were given from the, the monastic community and there was this reciprocity that was set up intentionally. Um, but you know, giving can, can take on so many forms. Um, it involves, you know, time and energy. The folks who came and set up the room for us tonight and, and greeted people, that's generosity, that's dana. Uh, dana is the Pali word the uh, the, from the Buddhist language. So if you ever hear someone talking about dana, it's, in a Buddhist context, it's not a woman's name. It's, <laughs> it's the practice of generosity, um, spelled D-A-N-A. So it can involve time. I think that smiling to strangers is an act of generosity. Um, giving your presence to a friend in need, a listening ear with an open heart. I mean, that's a beautiful form of generosity. When we're not expecting something in return and we can just give. Um, I've also realized that there's just a lot of motives that we all carry. And I expected my motives to always be pure when I was practicing generosity as a new <laughs> practitioner and would get very frustrated when I would find mixed motives. Um, and over time, I've really just seen it as an opportunity to, to see this mind stream, see the state of the heart as it is and go, okay, there are mixed motives right now. Can I focus on the wholesome ones and let them grow? And it's okay if there's a little bit of jealousy or a little bit of greed and a little bit of craving, but can I just let those soften? And can I focus more on the really wholesome ones and let that sense of freedom grow? So um, I like to share that because if any of you have minds that get as judgmental of yourself as my mind gets about myself, that might be helpful to know. Um, we all have mixed intentions um, and that's okay. You don't have to wait till you have perfectly pure intentions to act in ways um, that leave us rejoicing. So the Buddha was also clear, it doesn't mean give everything away until you have nothing for yourself and you're suffering and you sort of collapse in a heap. Um, but to give in a way that brings joy with the idea of giving and joy in the moment of giving and joy when reflecting afterwards. So um, I'd like to invite you in the coming week to just, you probably, if you start looking for it and, and turn the mind to it, attend to it, notice that you probably give a lot <laughs> without necessarily recognizing it. And another beautiful thing that the Buddha said was, it's wholesome to pause and recollect one's skillful actions like generosity and let yourself feel good about it. <laughs> Which is also, I find pretty counterintuitive for folks raised in a capitalist um, culture um, in a, many other ways to describe um, mainstream North American society. Um, because some of us who take on spiritual teachings might have this sense of, oh, well, I shouldn't be prideful, so um, that just sounds odd. But when the Buddha talks of this kind of recollection, it's a, again, it's a heart opening, expanding self. Whereas when someone's bragging about, oh, look at this thing that I did, 
the sense of self, the sense of boundaries actually kind of harden and we feel more separate from others. Trying to prove I'm good enough, worthy enough is actually this pushing away. Whereas the type of re recollection the Buddha invites us into is a, oh, you know? So I was thinking of a few weeks ago, I was crossing the street um, and it was rainy and slushy and I saw a woman in a wheelchair trying to get across and her wheel was stuck in the tram tracks. Um, and I just rushed over and I said, do you want to push? And she said, yes. So I helped her cross the street and we chatted and got onto the streetcar together. And afterwards I was like, oh, that was generous. And I had this little pinch of like, well, I don't want to be self-aggrandizing, but then I remember the teaching on collection of like, no, that was clearly a moment where I didn't feel separation between myself and this woman. It was just this easeful thing. It wasn't a big deal. Um, I don't think I'm amazing because of it. But I can appreciate that the heart was open enough and connected enough to just go and act. And it's actually one of the things the Buddha would teach as a precursor, as a preparation for sitting meditation practice. You have to have enough joy in the mind to then be able to face the suffering that we at some point will face when we come to formal practices of sitting and walking and, um, and looking at the Dhamma in deeper ways. We have to build up this reservoir of a sense of goodness in ourselves to be able to endure all the other stuff that we're going to meet <laughs> in practice and in life. Um, so I wanted to share that and in a similar vein I'm not going to go into a long discussion um, or discourse on the ethics but I find a lot of Dharma <laughs> communities and teachers will avoid talking about ethics because it can come across as heavy-handed, as dogmatic, it can touch seeds of perhaps pain people have from maybe a religious upbringing that wasn't um, a joyful part of their lives. Um, so some, I mean, some teachers and the community that I, I say I was raised in, um, the Plum Village community, we talk about, we call them mindfulness trainings as opposed to precepts. We talk about them all the time. <laughs> um, and we share about them and we explore them in different ways. And I feel so lucky um, to have been rooted and seeped into this kind of culture. Um, but the reason I appreciated that was because it came again with the spirit of, here's a way to bring mindfulness into every moment of your life. Check your ethics. <laughs> and, and it's also a chance to discover for oneself, not a fixed set of rules of do this and don't do that, even though that's what they sound like if you read the traditional texts. Um, but it's an invitation to over and over again turn inwards and say, how are my actions affecting myself and my community? And it's easy to feel or have sort of vague, glossed over ideas of like, oh yeah, that's a good thing, that's a bad thing, I know. <laughs> um, but the invitation is like, turn in again and again and get really curious I mean, you can be childlike and cure in your curiosity. See, so like, well, actually, the way I just spoke to that person, how, what, what kind of imprint has that left in this mind stream? Well, I felt like I had to tell him off. Well, beyond a good, bad, wrong, right of what that does to the other person, what does it do to ourselves when we tell someone else off? Does it leave agitation? Does it leave a bitter t taste in the mouth? Well, that's a reason <laughs> to perhaps take on skillful speech as a practice because the Buddha has this beautiful phrase of the bliss of blamelessness. That when we act with integrity, there's this subtle joy that we can tune into. And it doesn't mean, again, that we're gonna be perfectly different than ourselves all the time but just like even turning one degree closer to however our internal conscience, our internal sense of integrity resonates and getting a little bit closer with that can actually like it frees up energy. It certainly settles the mind. Um, and again, it's a foundation for 
the mind cultivation practices um, because when we're agitated from arguing and you know taking a little more not exactly overtly stealing but always taking a little more than is needed and worrying that someone's going to catch us like that agitates the mind or in a very gross example Pema Chodron uh, the Tibetan Buddhist teacher likes to say it's just flat out hard to calm your mind if you walk around killing and stealing all day to make the point um, exaggerated you know um, but the way we act affects our mind and that mind is what <laughs> shows up on the cushion it's what shows up uh, as we're walking it's what shows up in our relationships with people that we love or people that we don't love <laughs> and at work and um, it's all connected so the basics are often worded as I undertake the training um, to not kill I undertake the training to not take what is not given or not steal I undertake the training to avoid sexual misconduct. I undertake the training to avoid harsh and um, false speech. And I undertake the training to uh, not consume intoxicants that cloud the mind, roughly. Um, in my community, um, Thich Nhat Hanh, and it was eventually a whole committee, rewrote them and they're long paragraphs, so I don't have them memorized. But they always begin with a statement of aware of the suffering caused by killing. I commit to cultivating the practice of reverence for life. And turning it around to see what are the wholesome qualities that, um, that we want to generate in our lives. And then there's always a whole paragraph which um, can be both beautiful and a little cumbersome. <laughs> so I like to both go to the simplicity of the originals, um, but those can also just be this, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, um, which doesn't always carry across the spirit of the freedom of mind heart that we're looking to cultivate. Um, so I appreciate both. And turning it around to, so at, avoiding killing is cultivating reverence for life. When I feel reverence toward another being or an animal or the planet Earth herself, my heart is happy. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if any of you noticed when I first came in, especially in Zen traditions, we do a lot of formal practices of bowing to our seat, to our bowl, um, bowing when we sound a bell, like we bow all the time. And it can seem a little odd for new people um, or formal and like, why are you doing that? But what I've found and the way that I take on the practice is that there is this momentary reverence for everything. Reverence to have or gratitude or a heightened aliveness heightened sense of presence in the smallest of things um, that has brightened and transformed my life phenomenally and I think of that all as an extension of reverence um, the few times lately that I've been with friends and I haven't paused to really look at my food and let my heart be filled with gratitude and a sense of interconnection before I start eating halfway through the meal I was like something just feels awful. I was like, oh, I didn't start with reverence. And it just be it can become this heightened baseline. And I know you all live in the city <laughs> and you're not going to have every single moment a uh, bright shining, oh, isn't it all wonderful, right? It's not about being airy-fairy out there, woo-woo. Um, or even having to do it all the time, but even like once or twice a day pausing and finding a way to cultivate a little more reverence. For some people that's being vegetarian, I think it's a great idea. I think it's not right for everybody, <laughs> um, but that's often uh, a way that the teaching gets expressed and it, if it inspires you, it can be phenomenal. And if your body works well with it, um, that's one way. Um, but there's so many ways to cultivate reverence for life. And then the second training, or the second precept of not taking 
what's not been given, um, it's all about cultivating generosity because stealing is the opposite of generosity. And I find I like to bring the word reciprocity into understanding generosity because even receiving is a part of the cycle of generosity. Um, if no one receives, then who can give? <laughs> um, and it's one thing to take. Taking rarely brings a wholesome state of mind, rarely brings more peace into our hearts and the world. Um, but if someone wants to give, it's actually a self-centeredness and a belief in individualism that keeps us afraid, perhaps for good reasons from early childhood trauma. You know, there might be really mm, well-worn reasons that we've learned to, to like, no, no, it's okay, I don't need anything, or I've got it all covered. Um, but the softening of the heart that when someone joyfully and skillfully just wants to offer something, it's also a really precious quality to be able to receive. And so I just want to add the word reciprocity into the teachings on generosity, to be part of this flow that lessens the sense of self and other. Um, just amazing. Sexual misconduct. Um, so I'm sitting here as a nun, I practice celibacy, um, but I didn't my whole life. I, I was not a nun my whole life. Um, and this was an interesting one, because when I first heard it, I was like, what does that even mean? And being queer, like religious communities um, and their takes on sexual activities, I didn't have much trust <laughs> that there could actually be wisdom there. Um, but. The Buddha didn't have much to say about the specifics of what that meant. Often it was don't commit adultery, don't get into relationships with people who have other commitments with secrecy and lying, because that ties into the lying aspect of, you're just all gonna be stressed out. <laughs> um, that's a lot of weight to carry around. How am I gonna negotiate this, right? Um, uh, don't, uh, do whatever you can to, to stop and prevent sexual abuse. That's a way to practice the third mindfulness training that I think, um, especially in an area of, of Me Too, like, and prevent sexual harassment. Yeah, that's, that's something that I realized I could buy into. <laughs> um, and this sense to like, just check in. How does a sense of integrity feel in how I relate to people, whether it's sexual or otherwise? just like check an integrity of how I'm using my life energy and to see if that can be a wellspring to open up a source of joy because <laughs> um, when our energies are used well we thrive we flourish right and so just to say like you know how we use our life energies matters and to I'll go so far as to say, let ourselves all interpret all of these as we will, but come back to this foundational aspect of just check in. What's this experience really doing to myself and others? And just keep checking in as opposed to come to one static answer. That's the mindfulness training in every moment. It's, it's the not having a rigid version of what each of the precepts means, but keep checking in, keep checking in, stay really attentive to how your actions affect your mind stream, the energies and minds of those around you. Um, I already spoke a little bit about um, the fourth training around not using harmful speech and cultivating wise speech. Um, when I first took the five trainings, 2005, I think, um, I had no qualms with this one. I was like, of course I'd like to speak in a way that's truthful and kind and timely and appropriate. Um, and the more I practiced, the more I just felt like it was the hardest one because we're talking with people all the time. <laughs> and there's so much habitual reactivity that we've learned. Like it's, it's so hard to pause <laughs> and try something a little bit different. Um, and when there is a groundedness in wisdom, the way that 
speech plays out can like bring so much joy. It can bring healing. And it can bring so much harm and so much hurt, right? Um, so again, just an invitation to check in, like, oh, how is my speech affecting me and others? Um, and am I inspired to like try one thing that might bring a little more pausing, a little more kindness, a little more honesty? Um, yeah, and then the intoxicants, again, um, a zone where some people are like, listen, I'm not giving up alcohol. I'm not going to join Buddhism <laughs> if you make me not, <laughs> not drink. So I'm not here to tell you anything to do or not do, but I'm inviting you to look at what you consume. And in my community, we take this actually as a very vast training, not just about um, drugs and alcohol, but like television shows. What kind of input and effect does that have? Anything that we ingest magazines, websites, <laughs> um, as well as like junk food <laughs> or any of the types of foods that we eat um, and intoxicants. I, um, I never drank or did many drugs when I was younger. And so when I took the trainings again, I was like, oh, this one's not a big deal. I don't even need to give anything up because I do it so little. Um, but I really took to heart the, this essence of like, don't change your actions, just start noticing more deeply what the effect is. And so I started really paying attention um, when I did, at that point I was having some alcohol and I noticed every time I drank alcohol, it's because I was in a social situation where I was really uncomfortable. I didn't really wanna be there. I felt lonely, I felt awkward. And so I drank. Um, and after I watched that about four or five times, I was like, I hate this reason for drinking. I don't like how it tastes. I don't like how I feel afterwards. Why on earth am I doing this? And then I was inspired from my own, from my own experience, my own insight to change. Um, and I gladly gave up drinking and then realized, oh yeah, my dad died drunk driving when I was a kid. And there's a lot of alcoholism on that side of the family. And I started to feel this joy of like, okay, I'm one person who's not going to continue that. And I actually actively started to feel like I'm healing. I'm, t I'm doing this for my dad and for my grandpa and all the ancestors who couldn't handle their alcohol. I'm at least one person who's like joyfully a constant designated driver <laughs> and, and just not going down that path. And do you see that difference between like, don't do it because it's bad into this invitation to look like, where can you find a joy of integrity? And go for it, like take one little step and explore and reflect. I've been vegetarian since I was 15, but when I had cancer and I was really anemic, I ate chicken. You know, I changed when my conditions changed. I didn't like the taste, so once my iron levels were good and I was healthy again, I stopped. But, you know, it's, it's, just, it's check in in the moment. What are the causes and conditions? Respond as best you can. Learn from it, respond to the next moment as best you can. Learn from it, respond to the next moment. That's the teaching on ethics that I think is worth sharing. <laughs> um, spoke a little longer than I thought, but thank you so much for your listening. And I'm really curious how this lands for you. Um, there's no need to agree with any of this or disagree, <laughs> but I hope that we can um, open up the space for reflections, because I imagine a lot of you in this space have your own insights uh, or, or questions or challenges that can just be really helpful to speak into this space really as a gift of, of shared wisdom. So I'd like to invite Three Sounds of the Bell just to let this settle in. Um, I don't know if you have a process for how you share, but um, we can open up the floor. And do you want to say anything about that? Um, usually uh, we tell you to signal when you speak, and we are allowed to signal that we are done. And Great. Mindful speech and mindful listening. Awesome.
Awesome.